casual use of illicit drugs among young people in this country has become almost routine. Those who have not tried them are in the minority. Forty years ago, drugs were the magic bullets of the doctor's armory. Their use, controlled, legitimate and respectable. Drugs were something you got from a doctor, not a dealer. Gradually, there has been a loss of innocence. As they started to spill out from the surgery onto the streets, the epidemic took off. Well, I went to the doctor because I was putting on weight. And he said, all right, Rita, you're a nice doctor, my doctor. And he said, all right, Rita, I'll put you on some slimming pills. I don't honestly know the name of them, but we called them black bombers. And it was a good slimming pill. You just could not eat. I used to have to force to have a piece of toast with a cup of tea or coffee. And if you was a smoker, then you'd never stop smoking. Black bombers were a form of amphetamine, a powerful stimulant which suppressed appetite. They also produced a rush of energy. You couldn't sit down. I mean, it just made you keep going, go, go, go. My curtains had never been down and up so many times in their lives as they were when I was on them. And cupboards, I mean, I wasn't a great housewife, but my cupboards were spotless because I kept taking things out, washing them and putting them back. One of my neighbours said, I've got such a lot of work to do, I'll never get it done. And I said, oh, don't worry, I'll give you one of my pills. And she said, well, well, I said, well, you'll just work and work. I said, they're called black bombers, they're lovely. And at three o'clock in the morning, she was getting her kids out of bed to get the sheets off the bed to wash them. She, she just could not stop. But I did not take one every day. I'd miss a day here and there to give myself a chance to get off the smoking, really. I was smoke dry. It was like smoke kipper. Mainly middle-aged women, I suppose, came along for uh, amphetamines. And they help a bit. They suppress the appetite to begin with. They improve the mood to begin with. But after a while, they don't help either of these things much. You've got the original problems back. They weigh as much as before. They're as miserable as before. But they're stuck with a drug habit as well. I don't think it was much of a problem among the sort of middle-aged women who were mostly taking them. I think the problem began to be when it spread out more among the young. I've had a weight problem all my life. And uh, my mother suggested that I went to see the family doctor and he prescribed diet pills. I didn't actually realize what they were, but uh, I used to work in a supermarket and um, I was realizing that I was filling the shelves faster than anybody else <laughs> amongst my compatriots. And, um, and one day the, uh, the manager w who was talking to me about my diet pills, and he says, you know what they are, don't you? And um, I didn't really know, and he, he told me, uh, you're taking black bombers, you know, they're really heavy amphetamine. Really, you know. So uh, I went back to the GP and told him that they weren't really working that well and uh, doubled the dosage. <laughs> Some patients who'd got used to having them regularly would come and quite openly ask for another prescription for 100 as a matter of course, and they would perhaps do that um, once a month or so. It was very difficult to, to resist uh, patients requesting these sort of amounts because it was quite well known at the time that these substances were not very strictly controlled. Only quite recently they had been available off prescription altogether, just like aspirin, and it was only in the 50s they were brought onto prescription, quite late in the 50s. And um, so people were used to having them fairly freely available, and if one doctor didn't prescribe them, it was a fair bet another one would. A black market in amphetamine pills soon flourished. Teenagers were quick to take advantage. School kids made willing customers. For some, 
Pills were the perfect cure for adolescent anxieties. Well, I was pretty much of a loner. I'd just left uh, being in care most of my life. And uh, I'd just moved back to Brixton and uh, I'd started senior school. The first time I took them, it didn't do much to me, except it made me feel good, and it gave me this amazing confidence, but I still had this shyness. And it wasn't really until about second or third time that, you know, it sort of kicked in, and I, I sort of changed from a shy introvert to a, a really outgoing <laughs> extrovert, you know. It's as though you've just been, you've just been given a load of energy. And I mean a load of energy, you, 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 your mind's alert, you're, you're buzzing. You're literally, you know, talk ten to the dozen, chew your gums off, you know, chewing, chewing like I'm talking ten to the dozen, eyes like that, uh, pop, pupils the size of a golf ball, you know, like that. And you stay up all night. It was extraordinary the amount that universities were built on amphetamine. It was extraordinary. Uh, and there was, uh, I went to Cambridge, and <coughs> you go to a very standard pharmacy down the road from your college, and you walk in and you say, um, uh, good morning, Mr. Smith. He says, morning, and say, I'll have 150 Drinamil, please. And you say, fine, that'll be six and sixpence. And uh, a lot of students, myself included, would do, do your, our revision on amphetamine and do huge tracts of revision, revise for 24 hours, and then sleep, and get up and revise for another 24 hours. I'd read about all these Cambridge buds taking uh, amphetamine to do their exams. So I thought, I know what, I'll take a couple before I do mine. Because like they're at Cambridge and I'm at Aristotle Secondary, you really believed you were writing something that was totally excellent, you know? And uh, they came around, guys got all the papers back. He said, I've read a lot of essays in my time, he said, but this year's crop, he said, one stood out from all the rest. And I thought, I bet that was mine. And he said, uh, Tom, would you like to come out here and read your uh, novel? to the class. Well, I, I was feeling all chest swollen and all that, and I got out there, I picked up my composition, and I started to read it, and after the fourth word, I stuck blank, and I could feel myself welling up. And he looked at me, and he said, yeah, it's crap, isn't it? You know, <laughs> he said, go sit down, you know. Amphetamine abuse can make you study a medical diagram for 24 hours, uh, particularly a diagram of the posterior surface of the abdominal wall. It makes you think that, um, uh, that you'll be able to tell where all the organs in the abdomen are if you know this one diagram. So I learnt this diagram passionately for 24 hours. I was on this diagram. I was going to reproduce this diagram, and I did in the question on the head and neck. And I knew it was the wrong one, but it was like, to hell with it. I'm going to give them this damn diagram. No, I failed. By the early 1960s, enough amphetamine pep pills had leaked onto the streets to fuel Britain's first underground drugs craze. Mods, speeding on Dexes, Black Bombers and Purple Hearts, could dance all night in the clubs which sprang up around the country. It was, you know, uh, the thing to do. You, you know, you'd dress up in your stylist suit and your Speedo shoes or whatever you were wearing that week. 
and go clubbing. If you went to the toilet, you'd see queues and queues of people, girls just waiting to go in, bottles of coke, pill in one hand, bottles of coke in another, waiting to go into the toilets. Um, you'd come out, and then it was just party all night. We'd get there blocked, we'd arrive blocked, basically, and, uh, you know, chewing furiously. We'd dance most of the night, you know, or talk rubbish to each other. Every time you'd start to feel that you were coming down somewhat, you'd, you know, pop a couple more and up you'd go again, you know. I remember going to a club and um, we'd, we'd taken some pills and then the following Tuesday we went back to the club and the DJ had said to me, uh, what were you taking on Saturday night? So uh, it was like, what do you mean? Uh, we never stopped. We were playing some really, really slow music, and you were off like mad as if it was something else, you know. And it was like, oh wow, I didn't take anything, you know, no. But, but that's what it did to you, you know, because you you're not aware. You, your senses you just aren't aware of what's going on, you know. And it's, but you you did have a good time. It gave you a a, a buzz. At the end of a sleepless weekend, Pillheads faced the inevitable come down. The Sunday was always quite interesting. Quite often, I'd go back up to South End, and um, there was a place in the summer, especially, called Come Down Hill. You'd find like hundreds of mods all lying there groaning, I'm coming down, man, go away, or whatever, you know. <laughs> Or if you still wanted to carry on going, you'd pop a few and you'd be talking furiously to the chap who didn't want to know anymore because he'd run out, you know. When you were on the come down, then you were just so quiet. It was like, you know, when nobody used to say anything to anybody, you know. Um, we used to get, get the train home on the morning and probably the quietest train that British Rail have ever run. Until now, choosing a new car was so confusing it was hard to know which way to turn. Until now. from Honda. This is a gotcha. <laughs> My heart rate is going up. It's a fast one. Right. Hands straight. <laughs> Tell me the real name of your father, Johnny Ball. His real name's Graham. When did you lose your virginity? When I was 17. Have you ever made love to someone and then regretted it? No. Well, yes. What do you know about the new financial organization called EGG? Well, I know they provide tailored solutions for each customer. Isn't that just a load of advertising waffle? So what? Who cares? It works for me. Name another breakfast DJ who you respect. No comments. <laughs> Are you being paid to appear in this advert? Where did you put the money? In my EGG savings account. See, I'm so honest. Can I go home now, please? <laughs> <laughs> Breakthrough to the new world of Mac 3, the first triple blade shaving system from Gillette. Three blades specially positioned to shave progressively closer. You take one stroke, it takes three, so you don't have to shave the same area over and over, which means less irritation. Three blades, fewer strokes, less irritation. Mac 3 from Gillette. Whoever thought of putting a phone in a box? Hats off to them. A phone you only pay for when you want to talk. A payphone. No contracts, no bills. Simple. A payphone in a box. Such a great idea. Somebody's done it again. 
Pay as you talk. The mobile phone in a box from Vodafone. No contracts, no bills. Just top-up cards for network access and calls. So to pay as you talk, the word is Vodafone. For safer overtaking, the new Honda Accord has one of the most powerful engines in its class. And yet, it's so quiet, it's as if it weren't there. The new Accord. Technology you can enjoy from Honda. The centre of mod culture was Soho, and one regular in the all-night clubs was a young curate interested in helping youngsters with problems. I got a lot of very curious reactions. I remember being in the Alphabet Club in Gerrard Street uh, uh, early one morning, and a very, very stoned young woman looked at me with absolute horror, and her eyes opened wider and wider, and I thought they were going to explode. And then she burst into shrieks of uncontrollable laughter and she said, uh, Blimey! For a minute I thought you was a vicar! So you'd get those kind of things. There were basically two types of pill user in the West End in those days. The weekenders would be the people who would come and descend on the West End when the West End was a focus, not just for drugs, but for everything, really. Now, of course, they had their problems, too, but my sense is that most of them came to no great harm. But the second group were the chronic pill heads, uh, and they were a, a fairly small, really highly disturbed group of young people who were heavily into amphetamine as a way of life. As I took more, I started to experience really bad hallucinations, I found out they were. And uh, I was hearing voices, uh, seeing things, uh, you know, at the corner of my eyes like that. You know, I'd imagine uh, things were going on outside my bedroom door, like when the house was empty. I was living in a world where that didn't exist, you know. Uh, all the things that were going on were only happening in my head, really, you know. You know, there was one time I thought I'd spent seven days going somewhere, and I'd done all this, you know. And when I asked somebody to date the next day, they only told me a day had gone by. <laughs> Kids always referred to the experience as the horrors, and it was a state clinically uh, identical with paranoid schizophrenia, where you really believed that there were little bugs uh, running around. They became known as meth bugs, and you'd find people furiously scratching themselves all over their bodies, thinking that these little insects were running up and down. And I remember one man who uh, I kept in the flat, uh, we were living just off Carnaby Street at the time, uh, all night, and he spent most of the night uh, chasing meth bugs and looking, opening windows and shutting windows, because he, he was convinced that everybody was persecuting him and the police were looking for him and there was some great conspiracy. And uh, finally, when I thought he'd calmed down, he, he ran out of the house at about five in the morning and ran to Western Central Police Station to tell the police that I'd laced his coffee with LSD. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In 1964, newspapers went to war on drugs. The Soho pill scene ceased to be a private culture and became a matter of public concern. Laws were introduced which made unlicensed possession of amphetamine a criminal offence. Doctors started drastically reducing the number of prescriptions and the police cracked down on clubs where drugs were used. 
I remember the flamingo. And ritually, the police would come down and bust it. So about half past three in the morning, one of the owners of the club would leap on, in the middle of a number, leap on the stage, grab the microphone and say, OK, lads. Van would stop. Meet Van's outside, and uh, you'd hear this sort of thundering noise. Because the music would stop, and everybody was dropping their pills. And the sound of the pills falling through the ground was, it was, like, it was like heavy rain. <laughs> But as one supply dried up, another source was found. Over a period of three years, I myself screwed, broke into six chemists. Right. We used to get over back walls, find the back window or something. Screwdriver in corner at window. And it shatters it, shatters the glass up, and just take the glass out. He went into the back of a chemist then, and all the speed was on the shelves. 500 bombers in a tin, 500 dexes in a tin, or 1,000 dexes, just depending on tin. And I used to stand outside top rank like that with tin. We used to sell them, threepence apiece. Police didn't know out about it, never bothered me. The police were stood there when they were doing it. Pill manufacturers and wholesalers began to be targeted by thieves. One person who was charged with receiving stolen Purple Hearts was Lynn Barmer. We were just taken to the police station one tea time and that was it. Put the fear of hell up me and I swore I'd never take another one and I didn't. And, and that was it. It was very, very frightening. I got fined £5, which isn't a lot now, but it was then. The highest fine was £90 and I was paying mine off at two and six a week. And um, it was straight down to the local cafe bar where we used to go, and we were told to leave. It was on the placards of the local paper, the evening paper, and our names were in it, and we were just asked to leave. And it was horrible. The day after, went to work, we were told we'd been given the sack. Everybody knew us, and it was just finger-pointing all the time. And it was harder for my mum to actually come to terms with it and get over it than it was me. My gran was very hostile. She was very hostile towards me. She didn't speak to me for a long, long time. And uh, I, I left to go to Butlins in Wales to see if I could start again, as they say. <laughs> Thomas Hood, by now a pill addict and pusher, also had his first brush with the law. I was in a cafe where I used to sell, and there was a police raid. I tried to get rid of some of the packets of pills to friends to take, so I wouldn't have so many on me. Uh, but I was still left with a load, so I started ripping them open with my teeth and eating them and washing them down. And I thought I could vomit them up later when they are gone, but they stayed there an inordinate length of time. And the next thing I knew, I woke up and it was Sunday morning in uh, King's College Hospital. Apparently I'd overdosed and had to have my stomach pumped out. I found that I couldn't, you know, take what was happening to me anymore. And it was just at that point my friend turned up and he had a box with a glass syringe in it and a little tablet that all would look like uh, saccharin tablets in it. And he told me what it was and said, fancy trying one. And I said, OK, and he put one in the syringe, put two mils of water in it and stuck half in his upper arm. So I thought, well, he's had half a pill, and then he stuck the other, what was left in mine, and I thought, half a pill. And as I used to live in a skyblock, we had to walk to the bottom because the lift was broken, 
And all the time I've been walking down the stairs, I've been feeling some sort of change in me. And as we walked out into the forecourt of the flats, it must have been like what it was walking into the streets of Babylon, you know, under the hanging gardens, like, because I remember it was a drizzly old night as well, you know, but it was this wave come over me, you know, it was like the biggest tidal wave you could ever imagine, but made up out of an orgasm, uh, something else. I thought my problem had been solved, you know. I thought I'd easily be able to get by on this. You know, and I'll switch to this one. I got off amphetamine in less than a week, and uh, that was it. I, I left all other drugs alone then, except for heroin. In the mid-60s, when Thomas Hood had his first fix, heroin came in the form of pure pharmaceutical pills. Since 1926, it had been legally and humanely prescribed to a handful of addicts who had typically developed a habit after receiving heroin in the course of medical treatment to relieve chronic pain. But like amphetamines, it started to pass from doctor to dealer and onto the streets. The first fix is the one that you remember, it's the one that you chase for the rest of your life. It's never quite the same. You do get high, but it's not the same as the very first one. The night of Colin Paisley's first fix is indelibly etched on his memory for more than the obvious reason. We were in a pub about 10 o'clock and someone brought in the, the next day's papers which had been published early. A splashed across the front of it was Kennedy assassinated. Two hours later, I was in the toilet in Piccadilly Circus, injected with uh, my first heroin. As we came out into the lights of Piccadilly, I could feel the heroin taking effect. The pavement seemed a bit softer, the lights started to dance about, and we were immediately stopped by the drug squad. And I knew that I was going to be sick, and there was not a thing I could do about it. And unfortunately for the member of the drug squad, I spewed all over him. And that, uh, I've never forgiven that, uh, particular police officer because he ruined my first fix. Heroin's like a cocoon. It's like a warmth around you. It's like um, a cocoon against the world. You don't, you don't, you don't feel pain. You don't feel emotional pain. You feel safe. You feel um, powerful, I suppose. I suppose the nearest I can come to it is the whole body and mind being enclosed in cotton wool. Nothing can get through either physically or emotionally. Britain was seeing a new type of heroin user. They were young and working class. The earlier heroin addicts had been predominantly middle-aged and elderly. They were aristocratic, upper middle class, eminently respectable. Most of them had become addicted by accident in the course of medical treatment. Now, by the early 60s, that was changing, and we were getting what the Home Office called non-therapeutic addicts, that is, addicts who had become addicted in other ways than through the treatment of pain. They had their own geographical base around Piccadilly Circus, and they became known as the Piccadilly Junkies. We felt we had absolutely nothing in common with straight people. We had no straight friends. It's just like they were completely different to us, really, and, and we felt sort of like superior, really. We just felt they had sort of like horrible, boring, mundane lives with their mortgages and two-point-whatever children. 
they trusted me because I was too short to be a copper. And I was a, a bit of a curiosity because I was a journalist. And I spent night after night after night in the dilly with these extraordinary kids. Alan Bestick was among the first to chronicle the Piccadilly junkie scene. I often wondered why they took heroin, because it seemed to me a terrifying thing to do. And yet, the answer was always the same. I thought I could handle it. And they would go through the honeymoon period when everything was wonderful. One lad said to me, it's like living, lying on a big pink cloud. And you were totally protected from all life's worries. And it was lovely. It's a lovely drug, let's face it. But then the honeymoon period would end, and they'd have to have more and more heroin. When I was first addicted, I actually didn't know I was addicted. I mean, I remember that, you know, I started getting colds and, you know, sniffling and all that sort of thing. Uh, but it didn't, it didn't occur to me that it didn't connect in my brain that the times when I started getting sniffly and sneezing and feeling ill were the times I stopped taking heroin. So it just, you know, this was just like, oh, I keep on getting these funny colds. And then it would go away. And then I remember one day somebody said to me, You've got a habit, you know, you're withdrawing. And, I, and suddenly you realise, yeah, that's what it is. Feeding an escalating habit drove addicts who were desperate for heroin to cash their daily prescriptions as soon as they could. Midnight took on a special significance as it was the start of a new day. They would go to Boots where tomorrow began at midnight. They came from all over the place, all over London. And there were three clocks in Piccadilly, including a big Guinness clock. I always remember that one. And the, they, they would be watching this, and the can would creep around to midnight. And then the man behind the counter, a, mo a most kindly man, dealing with what most people regarded as a great heap of scruff, and wrinkled their noses and backed away from, you know. He was lovely to them, you know, he was gentle with them and so on. And they would get their, their, their they would cash tomorrow's script at one minute past midnight. It's a time when all pain is erased because the drug is dispensed. It takes seconds to go from the chemist to the toilet, stick the needle in to get well again. Junkies made difficult patients, and only a handful of doctors chose to take them on. One GP found that she had become a heroin prescribing doctor by default. I went on holiday for about three weeks, and I left um, a locum in charge, obviously. And when I came back after the end of three weeks, I found that she had been happily prescribing for a couple of addicts while I'd been away, by which time it was difficult to get rid of them. They thought that they were part of the practice, so I just really went on accepting them, hoping that I would learn how to cope as I went. It never entered my head that I, they were going to come flooding in. I thought two was enough. <laughs> and um, they all wanted lots more expertise than I had to offer them. All I really had was a prescription, a little moral guidance, and not much more. You know, I always felt that as a GP, all right, um, I sort of had the first look, and if I thought it was beyond me, there would be some sort of consultant to whom I could turn for advice. But when I got to addiction, I couldn't find anybody who was able or willing either to give advice or to even consider any hospital admissions, which obviously the majority of them, if they were going to successfully come off, uh, were going to need.
Searching for ways to enhance the look and comfort of your home? Why not try this simple step? Philips Soft Tone. See your home in its best light. The Millennium Bug will affect every business in the UK. If you rely on any form of technology, this issue affects you. Action 2000 has been set up to help. They've produced this pack. Ring for it now. Because no matter what business you're in, you need to be in the business of getting ready. Act now. Call 0845 601 2000 for your free action pack. Prepay phone. No bills, no contracts. Use it, don't use it. It's your call. To paint, first you must see. I've spent my whole life looking and analyzing, studying form and light. It said Turner had poor eyesight in later life. It must have driven him to distraction. My paintings are all about atmosphere, detail, texture. The little things that make up the whole image. It's all there, and all you have to do is to look. My eyesight's pretty important to me. You had a group of doctors, National Health Service and private, who'd become known as the Junkies Doctors. And I knew most of these doctors, and a number of, that I knew were very, very dedicated physicians whose only crime was that they were prepared to work with a section of the community whom most doctors didn't want to touch with a barge pole. But there were some who did prescribe with extraordinary irresponsibility. Um, one doctor, Lady Franco, for example, uh, prescribed one-sixth of the national total of heroin in, the, in 1962. She pres prescribed six kilograms of heroin, 600,000 tablets. Lady Franco, I guess, was saying um, the man, the man that's uh, the connection, the person who supplied the drugs, although she was uh, totally unlike anyone's perception of, of a drug dealer that you could imagine. She was a kindly sort of granny type, auntie type, and uh, she had a terrible hatred through the pushers, which was a main topic of conversation. She would rather have an addict have three G more than he needs off her than maybe a grain less and having to go out and score. Ironically, such generosity created a surplus which supplied the very pushers Lady Franco hated so much. The black market at the Dilly prospered. News of Lady Franco and the liberal British system spread to heroin addicts living under much harsher regimes elsewhere, in particular to Canada. Well, I heard about Lady Franco and a few of the other doctors. I can't remember their names at this time, but Lady Franco is the one that stood out, that she was willing to help addicts, even the ones that had ran out of money, she would prescribe for them. And also, she had a few of the Canadians living out at her house out in the country. I wanted to go someplace where there was drugs and also where there was drugs that I didn't have to commit any criminal acts or get involved in crime to support myself. So England won out.
By 1964, 70 Canadian addicts had drifted to London to swell the local addict community to 342. The um, size of the community had grown, and it was a classic epidemic spread. Um, if, if you looked at the um, uh, under 20 figures, I'm speaking from memory, but it w the curve went up something like this. There was, there, was, there was one in 1960, there were two in 61, the following year there were three, then there were 17, then there were 45, then there were 150, and it went up until it reached the thousands. In 1965, the Ministry of Health produced a report on the crisis. Lady Franco and the other junkies' doctors took the brunt of the blame. The committee recommended that GPs should be stopped from prescribing heroin and cocaine. Instead, addicts would be under the care of psychiatrists working in special treatment centres. But as the legislation ground slowly through Parliament, the crisis suddenly deepened. In the spring of 1967, Lady Franco died. I've often wondered whether she died on purpose to spite the Ministry of Health because uh, their position at the time seemed to be that on the one hand we condemn these wicked over-prescribing junkies doctors and they're terrible and they've created the problem, but on the other hand we hope they'll go on propping up the old system until we're ready with our wonderful new treatment centres and then they will gracefully withdraw or we will force them to withdraw. And I don't think it had occurred to them that Lady Franco might do something as inconvenient as dying on them and throwing the whole Ancien Regime into confusion. Into the confusion stepped the enigmatic figure of Dr. John Petro, who took over Lady Franco's patients. He was to make her generous prescribing look tame. He was shrouded in mystery. He'd had a, quite a brilliant uh, medical career. He'd been involved, I think, with uh, early work with penicillin. But I think a number of things happened to Petro. I think his marriage collapsed. He hit the bottle in a big way. He was addicted to poker and uh, fruit machines. And all sorts of things went wrong. By the time I knew him, he was fairly senile. Petra really was more like one of us. I mean, he wasn't like a doctor. He didn't have to bullshit. He didn't have to, uh, when you went to see him, you know, he was just like one of us. He was our friend. I mean, the junkiest friend he was. He had his own habit to feed, and that habit was gambling. And he would appear periodically in hotels, mainly in West London. And he'd spend some time writing scripts for a guinea a time, just over a pound in today's money. Um, and he'd, he'd write the scripts until he had a stake to get into the game. And as soon as he had that, he'd leave. And if you weren't there on time, he didn't get. He'd be in the gambling clubs or pubs, or, and we used to go and sort of track him down, you know. You'd all be hanging around saying, oh, I can't find Petra. And somebody said, oh, I saw him in that pub. And so we'd all go charging off and, and get to this pub. And then somebody said, oh, he's gone to this. And you'd, so you'd be sort of like this, searching for Petra all over the place. <laughs> Uh, he used to have his surgery in Baker Street, tube station. In those days, there was a cafe down there, and, and he'd be there at certain times. He would sit there at the table um, with a pad of private prescriptions in front of him, and he would accept, um, without reservation, what anyone asked for. He said, uh, what we're giving you, I'll say, three grains of heroin, and he'd write that down, and he'd go, and, and then he'd write that down, and then he'd go, and, and then he'd write that down, and he'd say, anything else, you know? And that'd be that. I thought, what a good doctor. <laughs> I was probably third or fourth in the queue when a camera was put through the door and a photograph taken. Investigative journalists had discovered the first drug clinic in Britain in the Buffet in Baker Street tube station. And lo and behold, it was on the front page of the following day. Something had to be done to, to stop the epidemic. And that was why he had to be arrested and charged not with over-prescribing heroin because he would say, that's my clinical judgment. And you couldn't touch him on that one. But he hadn't kept records, so they got him there. 
but once he was arrested, there was a problem. 300 youngsters addicted to heroin without a doctor. The most frightening thing that really happened to an addict is being in a position where he can't get drugs. You just can't say to yourself, well, I'll pass tomorrow, because if you try that, you get so sick. The first thing that happens is you start breaking out into sweats. Then your bones start aching. Then your stomach starts really going. Then your bowels start going. And then even the sense of touch, like, say, touching blue jeans, it'd be like touching sandpaper. And it, would, it actually hurts the tips of your fingers. Your sense of smell becomes so acute, everything smells rotten to you. I thought I dreamt I defecated over the whole house. When I woke up, I heard all this screaming. I hadn't dreamt it. I'd shat all up the passage, all up the bedroom wall. There was hand marks on it, on the wall, on the passage where I'd felt my way along all down my legs, and uh, that was my bowels going in the night because I just had no control of them whatsoever. How long have you been on drugs altogether? About five years. How did it start? Tell me about it. Three years after they had been first proposed, the treatment centres were finally opened. Self-injecting drug addicts were a medical curiosity. I mean, when I started uh, uh, in that field, I'd only seen a handful. And, you know, and most of us had only seen a handful. Psychiatrists were divided as to how addicts should be treated. They were under pressure to cure them rather than to simply maintain them on heroin. Right from the start, it seemed as if we were starting amongst ourselves a race to cut down to prescribe less and less heroin. We started having monthly meetings at the Department of Health. The meetings were contentious. They started off with everybody looking at each other apprehensively out of the corner of the eyes, and then the, the ritual boast about how I'm prescribing less than everybody else. And then, once they got on uh, into the other discussions, people could get quite contentious about what should be done and the right way to do things. Each individual clinic had their own individual uh, philosophy. Some you had to sign an, ag an agreement saying that you would uh, go on to oral methadone within a given period of time. Others that you would actually reduce heroin at a given rate. Others um, who believed you were exaggerating and would give you half of what you asked for. I think the mistakes that were made that we made were by some of us being trying to be too zealous right from day one, saying, right, you're going to stop all this. We're going to cut you down in X weeks and that's it. They started interrogating you about how much you used and then they started cutting down. So if you say you used, oh, I don't know, six grains of heroin and six grains of cocaine, they'd give you three. So they immediately sort of forced you into a position where you know, they, 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 they made you lie because they wouldn't believe anything you said because their, their judgment on addicts were, was, seemed to be pretty low, that we all were liars and we were all manipulative and we'd all try and con them into giving us too many drugs and that's what they were there to stop and stuff like that. So, and it was, you know, it was immediately a sort of completely different relationship with them than with, with the private doctors. Carolyn Bond was about to renew her relationship with the most notorious of the private doctors. John Petro suddenly appeared back at the Dilly. He had six months grace to practice pending an appeal. But as ordinary doctors were no longer allowed to prescribe heroin or cocaine to addicts, Petro began to switch his patients to a strong amphetamine called methadrine. It was different to pet pills. It had to be injected. When you injected it, it was like your whole head was <laughs> sort of felt like your whole head was your head was being blown off. Your top of your brain was being blown off. It was incredibly 
incredibly strong. It's a compulsive drug as well. I could only write if I had a black pen, and it had to be a Bic, which is the world's worst pen for long distance writing because it's got this little hard ridge on it. And I have written until the blood poured out of my fingers. You'd imagine you had like spots on your face and you start squeezing them. And, and I remember once putting what was it, peroxide all over my face and, and awful things. And I've seen other people like, you know, thinking they've got something in their eye and picking at their eye. It, it was, it was, it, it's a really nasty drug. <laughs> Uh, it was used, I'm told, by Japanese suicide pilots, you know, and it really changed the scene in the Dilly dramatically. Lads I'd known as guys who would say, hello, Alan, how are you, and so on, and uh, be friends of mine, changed. They became quite paranoid and suspicious, and they would say to me, what are you doing down here? I suppose you're gathering information for your friends in the fuzz. I mean, both physically and mentally, it was incredibly harmful very harmful. I remember the day that it got, and eventually because of the harm it was doing, it got, it got banned, it got withdrawn from the market. Um, and I remember the day it got withdrawn, part of me was devastated, but part of me was so pleased. The methadrine epidemic was nipped in the bud by withdrawing the drug, but cutting back on heroin was counterproductive. Desperate addicts were forced to turn to a more sinister source of supply. The patients are great people for telling you what's happening. So there's a lot of Chinese about and I, First of all, I, well, I honestly thought they were talking about Chinese takeaway. Do you know, I didn't know what they were talking about. And then, you know, it was Chinese heroin. The center for the heroin trade moved from Piccadilly Circus to Gerrard Street in Chinatown. This was Britain's first street heroin. It wasn't a pill, but a powder which had to be cooked up before it could be injected. It wasn't pure, but was cut with other substances to make it go further. It wasn't prescribed by doctors. It was sold by gangsters. A fellow I was in a probe school with when I was young, he was selling Chinese heroin two days after the law come in that banned doctors from prescribing heroin. He was selling one pound bag, bags down Gerrard Street. I'd never seen this brown stuff before and all this like gritty stuff that wouldn't dissolve at the bottom of a spoon. And uh, I shot this up and I thought, blimey, this is better than the English stuff. There was a lot of English kids on the level of the street sellers. And then there was the, what you call a middleman. They were the Chinese that dealt in the half ounce and one ounce. And uh, I used to hang out down in the gambling clubs and used to go down the stairs, knock on the door, and they'd come to the door, you'd pass your money in, and they'd pass out uh, the bags of heroin to you. You didn't know what you were buying, you know. It, it's, it's a powder, you know. It could be, it could be anything. It could be brick dust, it could be strychnine. There was a number of deaths, you know, at one time with sort of, you know, it being cut. It was, you know, it was always cut with something, and you didn't know whether it was cut with something dangerous. So what I used to do is I used to get somebody else to try it first. <laughs> I warned in 1965 and 66 that if we cut down on the prescribing of heroin, the Hong Kong triads and other criminal syndicates who have been waiting in the wings for some time will start to move in and they will capture the market and once that has happened the whole scene will be as out of control as it has been in North America for many years and those warnings were not heeded and we reap the whirlwind as a result just as the new heroin hit the streets Petro was finally struck off the medical register Dr. Petro, in a sense, symbolized the end of the British system. Petro became a kind of a figure, almost a scapegoat figure, on whom all the kinds of guilt and sins of the people became, became dumped. I remember at the end seeing this very 
tragic, frail little man and thinking, goodness, this is the end of, a, of an era. Now, it could have been different, but I think with him, a whole era in British drug history died. Next week, do drugs expand your mind or close it down? The hippies and punks hit Britain.